Um, so I'm going to be talking about some bare metal installs. So firstly, I'm Nigel, um, and I work for a company called Two Red Kites. I uh, mainly do rails development and other things like that. Um, but I have found that I always need to have somewhere to host things, and this is what this is all about. So, um, so it's mainly about virtualization. Um, and to start with, just so you know, I am not an expert on virtualization. So um, it's something I've just, um, and I'm not an expert in Linux. So I'll just let you know that first, but I've had experience. So I just don't want you to think that, hey, this is my life and this is what I do all the time. I'm actually more of a DevOps and this is what I play with. And I found this is a system that works for me. So give you a bit of history, um, 10 years of playing with this, uh, different virtualizations. I always was very interested in it. Um, I actually was, I ran an ISP, so um, was always keen to find ways of uh, improving your box density. Um, tried many different ones, uh, used um, lots of different things that were out there, like some, didn't like others. And yeah, it was mainly around DC so that I could actually um, get the most um, bang for your particular box. And I stuck with one, and I'll show you that shortly. But so your options today, you, you've got so much cheap free hosting around. So um, it's, it's almost a mute point of actually putting your own box in a, in a server. But you may want to have it in your actual your own office so that you can test your deploys against that. Um, the downside of a lot of the cheap or free hosting ones is the performance can be low. Um, unless you pay a lot of money and then it gets higher. Um, but then most of them are US based and you get the latency issues. That's cool if you've got an international product, um, but if you've got an Australian based solution, which is what I mainly do, um, latency becomes a real issue and you don't want to host o o overseas. And you don't get much size or disk space and backup processes and everything else. So types of virtualization, um, I grabbed this this morning from an old slide that I did, so I think some of it's outdated, but let's just go with it for the moment and say it's correct. So, um, but, but before we do that, um, does everyone understand what the concept of a host is? So a host is the machine that runs multiple guests. Okay? So we then have a guest which is running on the host, duh, okay? and then context switching. And that's something that you don't want your processor doing too much of because Every time it does it, um, it basically has to get rid of the whole um, stack, move it off, and start a new stack, which is for the, um, uh, for the privilege mode. And then, then when it's finished that privilege mode, bring back the other stack and um, work on it again. So there's a bit of time that can take for those type of things. So. Okay, the simplest virtualization out there is guest operating system. And I'm sure we've all done it, where we've put uh, VMware or um, uh, VMware Workstation or something like that. Um, and so the pros is it's really easy to do. Um, and you can see from the picture there that basically you've got your, your hardware, you've got a host operating system that can be Windows, um, it can be um, Mac, it could be Linux, it doesn't really matter. And then you've got some type of application which is doing your virtualization. Um, it can support lots of different guest um, OSs. So you can do Windows, you can do Mac, you can do different things like that. Um, you don't have to change the host. So some virtualizations you actually have to go modify the host to support that environment. Um, and yeah, host can be, like I said before. So the cons, it can be very slow because you're basically emulating everything as it goes through. Um, and you get a lot of context switching because of it. So virtual PC, VMC workstation PC for Mac, those are the, some examples of it. Shared kernel. So basically, with that one, it's, um, if you look again, we basically got a host piece of hardware and then we've got a kernel, just any kernel of whatever we pick. And we've got guest operating systems running as a jailed root system side of that. Um, and that's the one that I prefer, and I'll be going into a lot more about that. Um, so the other cool thing there is it can support multiple Linux flavors at the same time. 
Yes, you use the same kernel, so if it's 2.6 or whatever you have on there at that particular time, they all use the same kernel, um, but they, um, uh, they can all be different um, flavors of Linux. Um, the other thing is they don't need to have their own um, specialized memory. They can, there's just a, still an application on the Linux box. So Solaris Zones, which is a non-Linux version, of course, uh, Linux vServer and OpenVZ. Hypervisor, I'm not going to go too much into it, but it's power virtualization. Um, you have to do lots of other things to make it deal with it. Um, ESX and Zen are those type of ones. So what should I use? Firstly, what are your needs? Um, if you're using it just internally for a testing environment, um, you might find that the um, having on your desktop, uh, like there's a good workshop happening right at the moment, it's about Docker, and that's, that's a whole other thing which is similar to uh, what we're talking about here, but that is just using a guest operating system on top of a machine. Um, and if speed's not important, it's okay because you probably have a machine that's just easy to set up and use it that way. Um, and you want to be able to reset easily. Uh, so I'd just, see, I'd just use the guest operating system type environment there. Um, if your needs are for a hosting environment and you only need Linux, then the, um, the, oops, sorry, the shared Linux environment is one of your easiest and quickest ones to use. Um, oops, there. Okay, so I use a thing called Proxmox. So um, now I've been using it probably, probably about six or eight years. Anyone know Proxmox? Nope, good. Um, so disclaimer, firstly, is uh, I have nothing to do with the people that make Proxmox because it is now a semi-commercial product or their, their support is commercial. Um, but I've just used it for a long time and I always promote it because it's a nice, easy product. So, so Proxmox uses OpenVZ. Has anyone heard of OpenVZ? Yes? Cool. One per two people. So it basically just builds on top of OpenVZ, which is an open source project. Um, it's, um, it's about 600 meg to download and it has... Now, I had played with OpenVZ prior to playing with Proxmox and getting it to work with a certain kernels and stuff like that. And now I'm talking six or seven years ago now, but it was, it was a bit of fun to try to work out how to get everything going and working together. And it was all command line. Um, so I found Proxmox, which was, as I said, a bare metal install. So you basically download this one file, drop it into a machine, um, and um, you could install from there. It was free when I first started using it. It was totally open source. Um, but he now charges, as any open source company does, um, they charge for your um, support, and that's the way that they can make money from it. Um, the host is a Debian 7. Um, it's got high availability, and it's also um, got firewall features built into it. So what we'll do right now... Okay, that doesn't work. There. We'll go actually start the install of a new one while we're just sitting here. So I'm using Fusion. So this is a bit sad that I'm now using a guest type operating system. I'm oh, not guest, sorry, a, um, uh, you know, a desktop type um, virtualization to install a host type system. But I thought it was going to be easier than having another box here and then swapping between machines and everything else. So, um, so basically what I'm going to do here is Demo, grab the ISO and say continue. So in normal case, this would be you putting a USB stick into a, uh, a box and booting off that. Um, in this case here, I'm just going to tell it that those couple of things. And let's call it Proxmox. And I'll just change so that we've got a little bit more. We'll give it a few processes. We don't really need to give it much more memory, but we'll just do that for the moment. And we might, I'm gonna just, because uh, I demoed, I, I tested this with the concept that I would have no network, because you can never guarantee you're gonna have a network at a, at, um, 
at a conference. So uh, I'm just going to use a private internal network for it. So, um, and let's start that off. And so all it does now is starts up and at this point here, this is what I was worried about, that it would not show up. I might just go, yep. Okay, so you can see all I have to say is agree to their terms. I can put a country in. Okay. Um, I'll put a password. Oops, get that right. And so we'll just call it ostc.com.au and I'll put it on two. Okay, so that's off doing it in the background now. Um, so while it's doing that, let's go back to this. Um, so Proxmox, uh, the guest operating systems can be Ubuntu, Debian, Fedora. Um, there's lots of different templates. So this is the downside is you don't install off uh, default operating system, so you wouldn't just go get a normal image, you use a template to, to um, build off. Um, there's many pre-built or you can actually go create your own. Um, and it, one of the nice things that uh, OpenVZ supports, but it just has built into the uh, web interface, is that you can actually do live mi migrations from one host to another. Um, and when I've done it, I can actually see I lose about a ping, one ping, um, while it's doing it, so which is kind of pretty cool. Um, so the web GUI, again, I'll show that in one moment, but um, you can see all the hosts, you can see the guests, uh, you can see little graphs are showing each one's usage. Um, you can add and configure, and there's even an API that you can talk to directly. Now, Proxmox can be just done by the command line if you want as well, um, but this is just a, an easy one. So our install should be Okay, should be done. Oh, come on. There we go. And so that's about how long it takes to install um, you know, on a normal box. So it's pretty quick. Um, and so it means you can get a machine up and running um, without much worry. You can see it's not happy about the CPU because it's on a, a virtualized machine. Um, and that's it. So that's actually up and running now. And if I now go back to a browser, um, I haven't put a certificate in this, so that's why that's coming up. But you'd go put your own cert in there so that um, uh, that wouldn't be a bother anymore. And, and now they do a little bit of advertising, which they never used to do, but anyway. Um, so yeah, basically you can see there's our machine. Um, I can actually uh, go here and look at all the templates that I have. Now I don't have any, temp oh, sorry, those are just some of the default templates. Of course, I'm not on the internet here because I'm on a private network. So um, I will just, I will, I will just um, SCP a couple over so that we can do it that way and it's quicker and faster. But while we're here, you can just see here that we've got the information about the box its current CPU usage, and what's even better, you can actually see there we've got a drop. Everyone can read that okay, or is it not big enough? It's good? Okay. Um, you can actually look at um, an average or a maximum of values for all these things. So you see your server load, uh, memory usage, network traffic, everything from there. Um, you can actually see um, any of the uh, other servers, would actually be up in this list. Um, and there's all the other you know, network related things, everything else can all be configured from here. So what I will do is I'll just go get a terminal up and, and I think SCP, where do I want to SCP to? I've put my uh, show notes here.
Ah, actually, I'll do that first. So, scripts. Um, so, I'll just throw a, a um, key up there so I don't have to do that over and over. And so I want to do um, templates star to OSDC. Um, I, if you wonder about the OSDC, it's just because I put it into my uh, SSH configs to make life easier. But otherwise, I would put the um, the full. So what I'm just putting up there at the moment is a couple, the Fedora, the Ubuntu, and so there's a minimal and there's a, a full one. So now if I'm going back to this, you'll see those templates live here. And we'll go create a, um, a, a Ubuntu box. So, so to do that, we just go create a container. Um, we'll call it OSDC guest. Um, there's the ability to create resource pools as well, so you can actually put different um, uh, containers into different pools so that you can control the maximum that a particular pool could use. I haven't created any here, so we won't worry about that. Um, am I running out of time yet? Yeah, yes, okay. So I'll use the that resources. Um, Network. Okay, so that's actually going to create the the new instance, and that's actually complete. So it's up and running. Uh, sorry, it's actually there, and you can now see that I can go start it. And that's actually started now. And if we now go SSH um, OSDC guest. OSDC guest. Oh. That's in anyway. So, okay, so that's actually me on that particular, uh, in that virtual machine. So, um, that's already up and running, it's ready to use. Um, so a couple of things I just wanted to show here really quickly was if I um, into the actual host, uh, so this is now on the host machine, I can actually go into var lib, oh, actually well, before we do that we'll go into here and go, um, which one do I want to do? Okay. User add. Okay. Okay, so I'm now, I've just created a, uh, a totally different user. I'm in there now. I can see that and I could just do the, create that file, okay? Now, if I now go into this, um, the great thing here, oops, uh, lib, oh yeah, vz, sorry. Um, so this particular machine's 100 because that's where it just starts off as, and go to home, Nigel, okay, you actually see, oops, that's that file there. So this is now being able to see that particular file from the host as well, which can be a great godsend if you have to change a, I don't know if any of you have ever changed the sudo file and it's killed the whole thing that you can't actually get it unless you start the machine in privilege mode to fix it. Um, I've been in those situations there and I've been able to go straight to the particular file and fix it. You don't normally go in via the host at all, but this is just a, a, a simple example of what you could do there. Um, last thing I'm just gonna show is if I top this, and you can see it's currently got 
um, 512 of memory and we actually went to that particular host and resources and you can do this all from the command line as well. I'm just choosing to use this. Um, and hit OK. See the memory just change? Mm -hmm. So it's actually dynamically will change the memory. You don't, didn't, don't need to shut down the machine or anything. You can dynamically change that as well as um, if you see the disk space that's available to it at the moment. Um, I can actually dynamically change the, oops, the disk space. And we will now should see, that didn't change. Maybe I didn't, okay. Anyway, that's, well, basically I was just gonna show you those couple, couple things. So very interesting how you can just dynamically manage it as well. Um, but this is a shared virtual machine. So you basically, the, each virtual machine is root, jail rooted to that particular um, uh, directory, but still uses the same kernel. So performance wise, and that was one of my goals was to show you, but I won't get time, is I've got a box there, it's got 100 virtual machines with a HA proxy in front of it, and I can hit that as hard as I like, and they'll all perform um, at a pretty high performance because again, it's bare metal. You're not actually going through a hypervisor or um, an emulator or anything like that. So I think I'm out of time, so I don't know if I've got time for questions. And if there is any questions, yes. Um, if you wanted to share file system, would you have to do a map or can you natively share files? Um, I don't, oh sorry. So yes, so you're asking if, um, if two different guests would like to share a file system. Um, I don't believe there is any way of simply doing that because they are separate, but you would actually just mount it or using Samba or something like that, yes. So just like you'd do if you had two separate machines. Could you set that up on the host and share that into each guest? So, yes. Generally, what I do in that case is I'd actually create a default um, template which would have all those things and every time you create one of those templates it would already have all that information there um, as well as all the different users that you might want for that. Okay, thank you very much Nigel. No thank you. Thank you.